please remain standing for the reading of God's word. This morning, there are two readings from the book of Revelation. The first is from chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The second is from chapter 22, verses 1 to 5. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the lamb will be in it and his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. There will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, we made it to the end of Revelation. We've done a different book of the Bible every single week. If you haven't uh, been here, we started this quite a while ago, just each week different uh, we just started with Genesis, worked our way all the way to the end, 66 books of the Bible. We took some breaks out for, for Christmas and some other times. So uh, if you haven't been able to read the whole Bible through, you're always allowed to do that whenever you want. Um, but we're glad uh, we are here. It's exciting. The, the book of Revelation is kind of hard to sum up in one. What we're trying to do each week is sum up the book in one, uh, one passage. And Revelation was very hard uh, to do that. There is a famous theologian about 500 years ago, named John Calvin. And he has one of the commentaries, he's wrote a commentary that's one of the most widely known and, and, and historically over 500 years, one of the most important ones. And if you were to flip to the commentary in Revelation, you would find there's nothing there. And it's because uh, he said, his famous quote on the book of Revelation is, I cannot preach on that which I do not understand. Um, and so the hubris of me to think I could uh, to preach a sermon that sums up the entire book and one sermon when John Calvin himself couldn't even write a commentary on it is, is humorous, but we're going to try and do it anyways. So uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time together. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would uh, work in the heart of all the kids in our church, especially those in our, our class right now. We pray for them, uh, their teacher, Lord, that they would grow. We pray for all of their parents, that they would grow in faith and that their children would too. We pray for all of our older children uh, who maybe have wandered away, Lord, that you would draw them back. We pray now for everyone here, Holy Spirit, that we would die to sin, become more alive to you. Father, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So uh, I have a, one, of my, one of my kids doesn't really like to eat out at restaurants that often. And uh, a few months ago, he told us, he, he kind of woke up on, I don't know if he had a dream or something, but woke up saying, I really want to have a crab cake. I'm excited about eating a crab cake. And particularly, there's a restaurant uh, in this area that serves really good crab cakes. And so we were excited. He wanted to go out and have crab cakes. So it was like a big deal. So we all went, and the server came up, and he's like, I'll have the crab cakes, please. And the server's like, we're out of crab cakes for three months. <laughs> and a harsh lesson on how uh, how much, you know, the supply chains, a good little lesson there in economics on how, you know, things in different parts of the world affected us, even crab cakes here. But what I thought was funny about that is that the thoughts that went through our head was, wait a second, this is, this is America. We should have crab cakes. This is Virginia. This is Northern Virginia. This is Fairfax County. This is Reston. There should be crab cakes. Um, and then to, with the harsh reality that not all things are perfect like we want them to be, and maybe some things are not at all what they think or they intend to be not nearly as good as what we hope they would be. When John wrote Revelation, he was trying to make sure that people understood that what's awaiting us in this vision he had, that what's awaiting us is actually better than what we could imagine or expect. He was writing Revelation. His, his main theme of Revelation was to encourage us to press on, to move on because it's so good. What is coming to us is amazing. There will be no shortage. There will be no letdown. In C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, 
the last book of a series is a fiction series of books he wrote to it kind of explain spiritual things about this land called Narnia. The last one's called The Last Battle. And at the end, it's about all the characters kind of going into, into heaven. And uh, how he describes what heaven is like as you're experiencing heaven, he keeps saying, go in and go up. Keep going up. Keep going in. Is that heaven's is this amazing place that keeps getting better. It keeps going higher. It keeps going more wonderful. And, uh, and the same idea, if you think about a hike, you're always kind of wanting to give up. And so I, I see there's a little connection there that, that the idea that heaven is bigger and higher than you can imagine. And, but this journey in life, until we get there, is harder than we could probably imagine. And Revelation is written to remind us to just keep pressing on, to keep pressing on, to keep going on, because something great is indeed waiting for us. So how do we read Revelation? Again, the, the, it's, the, the, there should be a seven-week seven, series, seven week series just on how to read Revelation. So I'm going to give it to you in just about 20 seconds. And basically, uh, how, why many people are, get confused or struggle with reading Revelation is there's two big parts. One is that uh, the book of Revelation isn't just one genre. It's not just historical. It covers three different genres. It's apocalyptic, and apocalyptic literature 2,000 years ago was full of really vivid imagery and symbolism, right? It's also a prophetical book. Think of your prophets in the Old Testament. It's also giving a word from the Lord as, as what's coming, but it's also an epistle as written uh, for the first uh, three, four chapters, written as a book specifically for churches. So the, the book itself uh, changes from one genre to the next. Okay, that's one issue. And the other issue, and how you read it, again, how, how symbolic, how allegorical. Another big problem you have to wrestle with when reading Revelation is, is uh, when does this stuff occur? Does, did some of the stuff written by John happen during John's life, right after, a long time after? So you have to kind of juggle all of those three things together to figure out how you're really going to kind of soak in and understand Revelation. Uh, and the other only final two parts I want to make sure you know is that I had a, a seminary professor who corrected us seminary students daily when we took this course. It's not Revelations. It's Revelation, no S. It's one vision that was given to John. And the next thing I want to make sure is that there's something weird about us Christians and that I, I've met many, many Christians who I ask you, have you read the books of the Bible? And they'll say, yes, everyone except Revelation. <laughs> Why? I'm just afraid to read that book. And so uh, it's a common thing. If you find yourself in that ca category, there, there's lots of people like you. But the, the text I'm preaching on today is from Revelation 22, 1 through 5, the second part of what was read. But the first part was from the very beginning, Revelation 1, 1 through 1, 3. And I included that because I wanted you to see for yourselves that John knew what he was writing was pretty intense. And he says right in there in verse 3, blessed are those who read this aloud, who hear it. So I want to encourage you guys, don't be afraid of the book of Revelation. Read it. You're a blessed by reading. Even if it's utterly hard to understand, you are blessed by reading it. So this is how we're going to view it. And it's basically, there's two big themes in Revelation. That's all we have time to focus on. There's just two big themes. One is to press on. Life is imperfect, and he doesn't want you to give up. Press on. And the reason why we're going to press on, it's also because he wants you to, the, we need to get ready because something great is coming. So the, the two big themes of Revelation are Press on, keep going, and get ready. Get ready. Something wonderful is coming. So I hope you guys are ready to press on and get ready yourselves this morning. Revelation 22, 1 through 3 says this. And the angel showed me the river of water of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed. So what we have right now is what happened just prior to this explanation in Revelation 21 is that a, a new Jerusalem, a new city. So all everything that was before is gone. Uh, everything, everything has been destroyed and taken away. Everything, everything we understood about everything before is gone and something new is coming. And it's a new Jerusalem. It's not the Jerusalem before. It's a brand new Jerusalem that's coming. And what we want to understand about this is what is the, the, the text is focusing on. And so the first thing is that we need to press on because something great is coming. Okay? Press on because something great. The future is great. This future city is going to be amazing. So let's talk about why this future city 
is going to be so wonderful. All right? It's a new city. And I hope you notice from the text, uh, and what you've read from if you read chapter 21. So before this, Jerusalem was the center focal point of attention. Why was Jerusalem so important? Because in Jerusalem was this temple. And why was the temple so important? Because inside the temple was the presence of God, where God's presence was. And remember, that was always so important because of sin. We had no presence of God, and this is where you could go find him. And now, when this new city comes, it's void of something really important. This new Jerusalem is void of a temple. There's no temple in this new Jerusalem. Why? Because Christ, God himself, is going to be the temple. There's no longer a need for a temple. The temple was a symbol, a reminder. There's, you don't need that anymore. You have God himself physically present. Not only is there no temple, again, what we're going to see now is this temple represents a brand new Eden. Remember, so Eden, the Garden of Eden, is where we had this, this fellowship with God. And it's where everything went wrong. And now it's a new city coming because there's a lot more people than there were back at the beginning. It's a city dropping. And this city is not only just amazing, but it's amazing and also what it's proclaiming. Again, the fact that there's no need of a temple means that God's presence is right there. It's right there. We don't need to go anywhere. He's right there physically with us. Next idea, again, it's this new Eden. Again, we lost because of sin, we lost what Eden was. That's the beginning of sin. That's the beginning of our separation with God. That's where sin entered the world. That's where death, pain, sorrow, animosity, that's where all of it entered in. And because of that, we've never had the presence of God. And now in this new Jerusalem, no longer do we not have a temple, but we have this fellowship. This also uh, covers very much Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel was a prophet. And Ezekiel talked about what it was going to like. He was talking about when, when God does something great, he's talking about he's going to create this temple. He's talking about what this new temple in heaven is going to look like. This is in Ezekiel way, thousands of years ago. He's talking about this new temple. And he says, again, he's talking about how we're going to have this stuff flowing. There's stuff in the sanctuary. And he doesn't, probably, Ezekiel didn't even fully understand when he's talking about this new temple. He's talking about Christ in this new city. Again, Imagine living yourself, you're, you're living in a time, we are right now, where, where you maybe don't want to be here. You don't like how, how difficult it is to live in your city or on this earth. And John is saying, listen, press on in this world because what's coming later is amazing. It's so great. What's coming is so great. It should enable you to endure living in whatever type of situation you're living in now. And what's going to come, the first part of this focus is communally what this new city represents, the healing for nations. Nothing will any longer be accursed. This is what's coming. That's what's awaiting for us. The healing of nations and nothing will no longer be accursed. What does that mean? That the city represents an undoing of what the fall did. The fall destroyed the community we have with God, the community we had with each other. And this new city represents an undoing of everything that happened in the fall. In Genesis 3.15, um, we call this the first evangelical word in the Bible, the first hope, good news in the Bible. It happens right at the fall. Right as the fall happens, and God is, is cursing man and woman and cursing Satan, this is what he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, talking to Satan and her, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. He shall bruise your head. This is, a, this is a, a hint that Jesus is going to destroy evil and sin. So what we lost in the garden, again, it talks about the healing of the nations, right? We can't do that right. There's never been a time when the nations of the earth are at peace with one another. We're at peace with, even, with their own nation. Look at our own nation. I would not describe America right now as a nation at peace within itself. If you want to give someone a vision for a country or a world that's truly united and peaceful, 
the only place you can take them is revelation. Because at the undoing of all things, when God undoes sin, finally destroys Satan, destroys evil, and this new city comes down, all those who are in Christ are going to experience something that the world has never seen. Healing between the nations no longer is anyone accursed. And he describes a little bit what it's like to be in that city. Revelation 21.4 says this, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Those are things that are associated with sin and fallenness. So he's saying, this is what it'll be like. What does it mean healing for the nations and nothing will be accursed? This is a little picture of what that'll be like. So again, the idea is, listen, as bad as this life may be, this life has mourning. This life has pain. This life has sorrow. This life has death. That's a result of sin and the fall. When this new city, all those that are called to Christ, their new residence will be void of all those things. As great and high and wonderful that is, be reminded that means that those who don't know Christ will not experience this. As high and wonderful this is, hell is that just as worse. This is what awaits those who hold on to their faith. A city, an eternal place where there is no crying, no mourning, healing amongst the nations. What an amazing picture that is. What is the biggest plague to humanity? It's always going to be sin. What is the biggest cure? It's always going to be Christ. It's always going to be Christ. So when we tell you to press on, press on remembering that. Remember the biggest plague to humanity. Press on believing that. Cling to that, that the biggest problem in this world is indeed sin, our fallen natures being separated from Christ. And the greatest cure is always going to be Jesus Christ and his gospel. Press on to that. Press on with that, knowing that what's awaiting us is entrance into that city. Again, the second part, Revelation 22, 3, the second part of verse 3 through 5, says this, but the throne says, no longer will there be anything accursed, that's the previous one, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light from lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. So the first one is, press on, the future is great, Press on, your future is going to be great. If your future is in Christ, then your future is going to be great. What makes it a great future is what Christ is going to do upon his second coming. This doesn't mean that everyone's future is great. It means that those who are waiting in Christ, who are pressing on in Christ, your future personally is going to be phenomenal. So again, the first part of this verse we looked at, one through three, really talks about this city, how, how as a, a city, a society, it's going to function something we can't even fathom. And now as individuals, what we're going to experience in heaven is something we can't even fathom. Again, so what is happening here? A fulfillment of a promise God made. Again, so we see with this, this city, with this river flowing through it, we see first, it's the undoing of sin, the greatest plague of all kind. It's the undoing of that. And now we see a fulfillment. And this fulfillment is about a connection, a relationship that we have to God that will be something we can't even fathom. If we can't fathom what it's like the city we like, we can't even fathom probably what this relationship will be like. And this is what the second part is talking about. Jeremiah, a prophet, was given a, a covenant by God, a promise that God is going to keep. And this is where that's fulfilled. It's Jeremiah 31. It says, this is the covenant. So God is giving Jeremiah, a prophet, a covenant for what he's going to do. At the end of all things, God's saying, because remember, he's always about your heart. And he's saying that, listen, eventually I'm going to, to, to grab your hearts in such a wonderful way that you will no longer even need to read the commandments anymore. You won't even, because I'm going to be there. And it says this, for this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. It's saying we're going to be completely connected. And we're seeing what that looks like 
here, when it talks about what we're going to have, again, how we're going to, how we're going to work, we're going to be worshiping. His name is going to be written on our forehead. We're going to have a deep, deep connection with God that we can't imagine. And to imagine how this is so great, let's go back to looking at verses 3 through 5, Revelation 22, 3 through 5. And it talks about how we're going to get to do something. It says, we're going to worship him. We're going to be worshiping. He's going to be right there. We don't have to go to a temple to do it. You don't have to go to church. Imagine, like, heaven, there's not going to be a church to go to. You're just going to worship where you're at. He's going to be right there. Right? Isn't that crazy? And it's saying that not only that, it says, we will see his face. So we're talking about this wonderful connection. Again, let's understand what sin has done. Right? How sin ruined nations, how ruins has ruined societies, has ruined culture, how sin ruined all that. God's going to redeem all that, going to heal us. Here, sin has ruined our connection to God. And there's a great example that explains how bad it was. Moses was someone who desperately wanted to see and know God. But Moses didn't quite understand how bad sin was. Maybe he thought sin only affected you a little bit or, or just partially. And so Moses says, hey, I would like to see God. I would like to see you in your glory. And in Exodus chapter 33, sorry, yeah, Exodus chapter 33, he asks God this, can I see you in your glory? And that's what Moses is saying is, I think I'm good enough to see you. And God has to tell him, listen, your sin is so bad. Not only can you not be in my presence to see me, would bring destruction upon you. This is God responding to Moses. He said, you cannot see my face, for a man shall not see me and live. M Moses seemed to think that somehow he was, his sin wasn't bad enough where he could do, and God had to remind him, you don't understand, your sin is so bad that if, if I'm in your presence, I'm going to destroy it. And that's what we had. This is what we have apart from Christ. And what Christ has done was alleviated that, was redeemed us from that. We've been forgiven of those sins, and now we have something that's amazing. Again, we're living right now in a time Jesus has resurrected, and right now we say we know God, but when the city comes down, the way we're going to be connected to him and know him personally is even greater than what you think you have right now. Revelation 21, 7 says this. The verse just before says this. To the one who conquers, right, the one who presses on, will have this heritage. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. One of the most important things of the whole Bible is this term sonship, adoption. That God adopts you as his own. If you've ever known anyone who's adopted from one country to this country or from even one state to another state. It's a very difficult process. So you, you find your, your family, you, someone, you, you see someone you want to adopt and you're, you're ready to love them and you pull them in and you're like, all right, the, the adoption's happened. This, this child's now mine, but not yet. You know, so I'll give you an example of just what happened here. So if you adopted from Maryland, you have to wait till the adoption becomes legal in Maryland. So there's all these things that have to happen. There's a time. And so the parents who have adopted are like, all right, we're, we're, we've adopted, and, but we still have to wait. It's not quite there yet. And you've passed all the laws, the time that has to pass in Maryland. And now, according to Maryland, you've now adopted this child. But it hasn't happened yet because there's still other laws that have to happen in Virginia. So you have to wait for the court to pass in Virginia and the time to pass in Virginia. So the things happen in Maryland and Virginia. And finally... Legally, according to everybody, this child is now adopted in yours. But there's something else that happens in the process. They, they talk about psychologically, if children are older, or as they kind of understand adoption, there is a, there is a part where, where kids uh, have to, to, to determine on their own, have you really adopted them? Do you understand what I'm saying? What, what that means is, when, as you're older, as you understand adoption, many, many children who are adopted kind of have to, like, do you really want me? Are you ever going to really leave me? You kind of, uh, you, you've adopted me. Can you just drop me off? Can you, can you get rid of me? And, and children who have been adopted kind of go through this, this inner turmoil. And what we're, what we're seeing here, this connection we have to God, is that that feeling you have right now, however close you feel to God right now, however close you feel to Christ right now, is nothing compared to how close you're going to feel to him in this new city. Because the love you have for him right now is imperfect and tainted by our weak understandings of love. But in 
this new heaven, this new city, we're going to understand what it means to be fully adopted. Not just legally, but also in our hearts. We're going to have a connection to him that Moses couldn't have. We are going to see him face to face. We're going to worship him in person. His name will be on us. So when he tells us to press on, the first thing is to press on what's coming for us as a people in Christ. Get ready for it. It's going to be amazing. And for what's waiting for us as individuals in heaven, in this new city, is going to be amazing. Get ready for it. And the way we get ready for it is by how much we believe in it right now. And what does that look like? By clinging to your faith and by sharing it with those around you. As you cling to your faith, as you share with those around you, what you're really doing is getting yourself ready for what's coming. We live in a fallen, broken world where there is pain, there is sorrow, where nations are not at rest. And there's so many reasons to give up. And this message is saying, press on, something great is coming. For those who in Christ, our future is great. For those who don't know Christ, their future is not. C.S. Lewis ends his story of the last battle by saying something great. He says, imagine, again, we're going, either going, to, the, going to heaven, and he's saying, you know, everything that's happened up to this point is just the beginning of the story. Now the good stuff is happening. Imagine heaven like a book with an eternity of chapters. And somehow every chapter is better than the one before it. This is what's awaiting us for those of us who are in Christ. If you struggle with this, we're about to celebrate the Lord's Supper to remind you that Jesus Christ indeed did die and he did rise again. And just as much as he did rise, die and rise again, he is coming back to claim us. So how do we strengthen our hope in the second coming? By remembering the cross. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for coming. Lord, may the book of Revelation remind us to press on in a broken, fallen world, to press on holding and clinging to you in a painful world where we are just as broken as the world around us. Lord, encourage us to press on and to get ready for all that is coming to those who call on Jesus Christ. Lord, none of this is anything we deserve, but is all brought about by your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Thank you. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray.